this parent thing. It's a disaster. How many people have ever felt that? I think we all have. Uh, today I want to talk about the parent-child relationship, but let me just start by saying this. Um, I, I shared this with some friends just a week ago, right after church, and they said, are you going to tell us one more program that we can try and fail at and feel worse than we do today? We've tried everything everyone's ever thrown out there at us, this program, that program, this book, that book, and we've tried really hard. And none of them worked as well as they said they'd work. And none of them seemed to work as well as the author of the book or author of the program. And are you just going to shove it down our throat and I feel bad enough about myself already? Is that what you're going to do, Kevin? That was quite a humbling thing yesterday, last week. And I thought, wow, that is so tempting, right? I'll just throw some nice little program at you. It's not going to work. So today we're going to talk about that relationship. But before we do that, I want you to meet some of the people around you because it's important because we're in a relationship. Uh, and if we meet each other, then at least we know each other's names. Uh, and we can a little be a little bit more like Cheers, uh, where, you know, you just want to go and everybody knows your name. At least some people know your name. So here's the deal. I want you to get the name of a couple of people that you already know. See if you remember them. And then I want you to find, meet one person that you don't know at all and try to get their name. And I want you to try to embed it in your brain. And you only have two and a half minutes to do it. So good luck. All right, go. So this morning I want to continue talking about relationships. In fact, that the struggle is real. So when we talk about it, we want to, don't want to act like, hey, this is no problem, this is easy. In fact, it, after a while, it gets somewhat disconcerting, uh, frankly, I think for all of us. So we so wish that relationships were so much easier. And sometimes they are very easy, and sometimes they're really fun, and sometimes they're very smooth, and sometimes they're really exciting, and sometimes they're very joyful. Uh, and there's great times. So I don't want to be a, like, a, you know, an Eeyore here and like, oh, you know, it's all bad. You know, it's not all bad. But let's face it, really, sometimes relationships are really hard. Sometimes they go downhill. Sometimes they're difficult. More, sometimes they're more like a gravel road than a paved road. Sometimes they seem like a mud bog that you get stuck in. And so sometimes relationship, the struggle hashtag is real, right? Of course it is. Uh, and so here's kind of the big theme for the entire summer. So hopefully you remember this. In fact, here in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to fill in some blanks to see if, if I've been repeating this week after week, if we just need to can the repeat because you've got it, or maybe I haven't been teaching very well. But here's kind of the big idea. We are designed for relationships. That's what we're made for. God made us this way because we're made in his image, right? And he is designed for for relationship. Even in the Godhead, he was designed for relationship. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have this incredible relationship, connectedness. They're on the same page, singing from the same sheet of music. They are doing the same thing together in their own responsibilities. They are connected relationally. And then he made us, Imago Dei, in his image for relationship that he wanted to know us. Know us. It says in, in Genesis that uh, God would walk in the garden with Adam and Eve. He'd walk with them, talk with them. They, he was connected to them, had an incredible relationship with them. It's amazing to even think of that we were designed for relationship, but along the way, those relationships got all messed up. Started in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve decided to do it their own way. They wanted to be equal to God. And as a result of that, the brokenness kind of entered into their whole experience. And it even unfolded in Genesis 4 and this relationship between their two sons, Adam, uh, uh, Cain and Abel, and one killed the other because he was jealous. And from then, the whole world's history has been kind of a repeat of that whole thing. And so somewhere along the way, those relationships got all messed up, but our only hope is a spirit-filled life that gives us the ability to submit to one another, to have mutually submissive relationships that connect. So we've talked about conflict resolution uh, and all that comes into that because I think that's kind of the trick or kind of a key to this whole relationship thing is how, how do we solve conflict because conflict comes. And we've talked about there's three different areas, kind of the escape responses over here, which are peace-faking things. We can also do attack responses, which are, uh, which are peace-breaking things. Or we can do peace... Do you remember? Oh my gosh, you guys are awesome. Okay, peace-making things. And that the peace faking things are all about me and how do I protect myself and how do I kind of defend myself. 
Or the other side of the, the piece uh, breaking is all about you and all about how you're the wrong one. In, my own, you know, in our eyes, we look at the other person and go, you're the problem. You need to change. You need to do this. And I am going to probably assault you. I am going to litigate against you. And I will murder you, whether it be literally or in my heart. That's because it's you. And then this peacemaking uh, is all about one another, which is... Uh, so, oh, you guys are great. Okay, so maybe I'm doing well here. Communication then. We have conflict resolution, and then we have communication. And the three areas of communication we talked about was one, it was speak to be, speak to be, to speak to be understood, to heard. It's the same thing. You guys are good, you know. <laughs> to be understood. Not to overwhelm them, convince them, force it down their throat, but speak to be understood. And listen in order to understand, yeah. We're going to listen to order and understand. doesn't mean we have to agree. But you, we usually go there really quickly, right? Well, I want you to know, I heard you, but I don't agree. You know? But this is say, hey, I understand you. And then sometimes if you just let it be there, just let it stop there, people go, aren't you going to argue back? No, I want you to know I understand. Oh, I, I'm a lot like, I, I'm pretty quick to come back and say, yeah, I understand, but I don't agree. I'm way too quick at that. But, and third is then listen to speak in order to heal. In order to make a healing presence. Wow, that's incredible. So it takes us into Ephesians, which we've been talking about, is the, that God has called us to walk in love. As Christ loved us and gave himself for, up for us. A fragrant aroma and a, and a sacrifice uh, to God. That we need to walk in love. Somehow it, d- it defines the way we do life. That we walk in love. Now look at this in verse 16. So if you're going to walk in love, it says, then look carefully how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And here it is. Don't get drunk with wine. Don't have that be the controlling force in your life because that's just a waste. It's, it's, it's his. It's debauchery. It's just, it's just wasteful. It doesn't do anything. So don't get drunk with wine. But if you're going to have something control you, if you're going to have something empower you, if you're going to have something determine your life, because isn't there, having too much wine, too much drink, uh, any addiction, I, I define addiction this way. It is when your best friend becomes something that's not true. Any addiction. So too much alcohol on a repetitive basis changes and alters your world into a world that's not actually true, but it becomes your addictive way of dealing with life or drugs or pornography or whatever your, your addiction might be, shopping, whatever, it becomes when your best friend becomes something that's not true. But you want your best friend to be something that actually is true. So to be controlled and empowered here by the Holy Spirit is what it says. And then the results of that are addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord, having your heart be full of joy and have your heart be full of thankfulness. Look at this in verse 20. Give thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus. There be a thankfulness in your heart. Wow, those are incredible qualities. That's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. That's what it looks like. And the last thing that it looks like is this, is submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. So this submitting to one another, that red thing, is kind of an umbrella. It's a covering statement. It's the big idea for all the relationships he's going to talk about in Ephesians as a result. And there's going to be three sets of relationships, okay, as a result of that. But this submitting to one another is really a critical idea. Here's what it means. It means to, first of all, do you remember? To yield to one another. Yeah, to yield. It means to to defer to one another. It means to be able to be humble enough to receive and yield to the other person. That doesn't mean that you're weak or you're, you know, whatever. It means that you're strong enough to defer and to yield. And it also means to offer yourself to one another. It means that not only do you yield, but you have to come to the table and offer who you are. Offer your thoughts and and the way you see things. Offer your suggestions. But I'm going to yield and I'm going to defer enough that there's humility there. But I also will come to the table and say, here's what I think. And this goes both ways in any relationship. To be able to give and take. Negotiate. Find a win-win. At least as best we can. It means to stop resisting one another and to stop hiding from one another. We need the full you to come to the table. In your marriages, you need to say, I need the real you, the full you. 
all of us, because we're co-heirs in Christ and we need to come to the table and be equal with one another in God's creation. Yes, we have different roles somewhat, but we need to come to the table and both stop resisting and stop hiding. We need to offer ourselves to one another. We need to yield to one another. Wow. So this same, this relationship that we've talked about in the midst of husbands and wives, the next thing that Paul's going to address is the relationship of parents and children with the same umbrella statement submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You go, well, what does that look like in a parent-child relationship? So let me just say this. Beyond marriage, parenting can be the most challenging responsibility any man or woman will ever face. And there is never any lack for advice, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Everybody's got it, right? Now, you learned how to parent, right? Of course you learned how to parent. You took classes in it. For years you took classes in it. Probably decades you took class in it. It's called being a kid. You know? And as you learned what parenting looked like, it may not have been the greatest, or it may have been awesome, or it may have been a mix, probably, in the reality, or probably looked one way to you at one age and it looked a little bit different later. You learned along the way. But there's never a lack of advice. So this morning, the temptation would be to say, okay, here's the way to do it. But I'll have to be honest with you. I can't tell you how to do it. One is the Holy Spirit's going to have to show you. Second, the Word of God is needing to show you. And third, I would not offer the way that Diane and I did it as a model of perfection. We made our mistakes, and I'll tell you even a few of those along the way. So let's look and maybe see what it has to say. But if you're here this morning and you're thinking, oh man, this could be really painful, let's pray, okay? Just ask the Lord to, to speak to each one of us. Father, we want to pause right here. And we want to ask you, I, I ask you, if you would speak to everybody in here this morning in a way that you want to speak to them. And Father, you would speak to me. Father, this thing got called parent-child thing, it's both awesome and it is really hard. And so I do pray that you would encourage us. I do pray that you would convict us. I pray that you would direct us uh, this morning uh, to both address, deal with, uh, where we need to go, what we need to do, but also that you would, you would give us peace and a satisfaction of your forgiveness and your, your ability to redeem that which was broken. And so to that end, we kind of put ourselves right here in a sense on the, on the, on the stand to let you deal with us individually. Finally, I pray that I wouldn't be a shame creator, a blame creator, a guilt creator, but that we would just simply experience the fact that you can deal with us. And so it's to that end that we pray. Amen. All right. So let me, can I throw up a matrix real quickly here? I'm going to, whether you say yes or no. Um, but uh, I'm going to throw up a matrix. This is one I, that I was first presented with as an apparenting matrix uh, in seminary. Uh, and since then, I've been a part of a variety of seminars that try to say these maybe are two kind of general areas that we would uh, want to have, have uh, de define our parenting, maybe all of our relationships. But over here on the left-hand side uh, will be on the vertical axis will be connection. Uh, and that means how, how well are you connecting with your kids? How, how well are you connecting in relationships? That means not being their best buddy. We're going to kind of reject that. You know, you're not your kid's friend. Uh, you're the parent. Uh, now, I'll say later, it is possible to be a friendly parent. Uh, and let's just say it is possible to do that, okay? Um, but uh, over here is the area of connection. So we're going to have, uh, and then on the bottom axis, the horizontal one is going to be structure. Having structure, guidelines, rules, boundaries. Uh, this is the way it's done in our family. So we have connection and structure. So you're going to have four quadrants here, right? The upper right-hand corner would be uh, high connection, high structure. The upper left would be high connect, but low structure. Bottom right would be uh, low connect, high structure. And then the bottom left would be low connect, low structure. Uh, and so the question is always in these seminars, which is the best one? Which is the best place to parent from? 
Um, and, and it's a debate. It's not, I'm not going to tell you everybody agrees or whatever, so you can have your own opinion. Uh, but I would say this, uh, is that most, uh, and let's just so you know, let's cut off the corners here for a second, uh, because no one's that good or that bad, okay? Let's just take out all the guilt uh, and pride corners out of this, okay? So somewhere in between uh, all this is a good place to be. Um, so most people would say, many would say, that this upper right-hand corner is maybe the best place to parent from. High connect, high structure. They get that really meaningful connection with mom and dad. There's interaction. It really works. And yet there's, they know the rules. They know the boundaries. They know kind of what it's all about. Uh, and they know how to figure it out. At least they're told how to figure it out uh, and where to go. So most people would say that that's the, probably the best. I think that's probably generally fair. But then the question would be, well, if you're going to blow it, if you're going to mess up as a parent. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, I'm not going to mess up. Good luck on that one. Um, <laughs> but if you're going to mess up, which direction would you go to mess up? So ponder it for a second. We'll take a little vote here in a second. And it doesn't mean you're right or wrong. But so how many of you would probably tend to say, if you're going to mess up, if you're going to lean one way or the other, would go to high connect, low structure to the left? How many would say, oh, I think that's the way I'd go? Okay, great. Okay, how many would say, well, I think I'll go low, con- uh, don't, uh, don't advance too far on our s- slides uh, for a second. Uh, how many would go down to the low connect, high structure? Say, hey, you know, you've got to have some structure. The kids without any direction. How many people would go there? Okay, yeah, okay. Uh, and then how many people say, well, I just go, why don't we just go low connect, low structure all together? Let's just kind of, let's just go that way. <laughs> yeah, nobody's going that way. Okay, so um, probably the next one, let's go to the next one, yeah. Uh, probably the next one is probably, most would probably say going to high connect, low structure. A little bit lower rules, but a little bit higher connection. A little, a little less structure, a little bit higher connection. Most people would probably say, you should go that way. I'm not, I, I probably generally agree with that. Um, but uh, then the next question was like, okay, after that, I mean, if you're going to, what would be the next best quadrant to land in? Would it be, and, and probably the temptation would be to say, low connect, high structure. At least they're getting something, Right? That's frankly what I would have answered. Uh, and along the way, we've had this discussion with our kids. It was not a very fun discussion. Because we asked them, which way would you say you experienced? And they said, we probably experienced this bottom right-hand corner. A lot of structure and less connect. And I said, no, that's not true. That's not true at all. That's totally unfair. <laughs> Telling them what they experienced, right? I think that this is probably my biggest regret, being a parent. Is that at times, because in this bottom right-hand corner, low connect, high structure is all about rules. It's all about the law. And the scriptures tell us that the law kills. And I go, oh, man. That's a painful place to say that's what they experienced. Probably my only, that's my biggest, my biggest regret being a pastor. I really only have one, maybe one and a half. But one would be that the box that they experienced being a pastor's kid. You can't do that. You're a pastor's kid. And they were put in this box, not just by what they felt sometimes from Di and I, but they, from what they felt from people around them. Now, I was a principal's kid, so there's a bit of a box there too, right? But not near as bad as a pastor's kid box. And I remember one time, uh, JV football, my Toby was playing f- uh, for Marquette, and uh, he got a 15-yard principal foul. <laughs> Red flag, boom. Or is it yellow? I forget. It hasn't been in a while. I think. But he threw the flag on him. And one of the other parents, meaning to be funny, but having a little bit of truth in her, she stood up and she says, that can't be right. He's a pastor's kid. And everybody laughed, except me and Toby. Next play, 15-yard personal foul. 
And in his heart, he's like, really? Watch this. I'm not fitting that mold. I'm not fitting that box. Pastor's kid. Boom. 15 more. Now they're 30 yards. Now they're first and 40. You know? He's an offensive lineman. Wow. It's amazing. In some of these seminars, some of these um, times, they have suggested that maybe after the high connect, low structure, the better way to go is into the bottom left-hand corner. That low structure, low connect is better than, let's go to the right-hand one, put that in, is better than low connect, high structure because at least there wasn't all the rules without relationship. At least they kind of could figure it out on their own. Now, I'm not totally sure I agree with all of this, but I do find it interesting, and I find it unique in my own life, um, that sometimes low connect, low structure might be better than all the rules without relationship. Because isn't that what we sometimes do in Christianity? It's just all about rules and no relationship. We seem to live in a culture that said, forget the rules, I've had enough of it. What I need is relationship. And they've even gone away from that. So this has challenged me. This like kicks my backside when I, when I look at this. And so what I want to do is I want to look at the passage in Ephesians that Paul continues in this idea of submitting, one another, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And how does, what does that look like to be in a mutually submissive relationship with our kids as parents and kids with your parents? What does that look like? So let's go to Ephesians chapter, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Here it says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So let's just stop, start here and let's just go to children. Okay, so who's he talking to? He's talking to children, obviously. But in the Greek, there's a lot of different words for children. There's one for being a brand new infant, and we're not even going to list that here. But one of the words for, for, uh, in Greek for a child is pedion. Pedion is a, it means a young child, usually from infant to about five years old. And the whole idea here is they're very dependent. And remember, right, some, a kid can't even live. They're totally dependent on you. To feed them, clean them, bathe them. There's an incredible... Now, obviously, as infants, they're that way. But up through a certain age, they're totally dependent on you, right? So the Greek word for that is, is pedion. And the, the key idea here is attachment and nurture. Early in a child's life, there's an incredible need for nurture and attachment. We talked a little bit about it last week, this attachment theory. In fact, look at this. Out of the, an article by David Howe, called The Attachment Across the Life Course, a brief introduction, he writes this. The most important tenet of attachment theory is that, an, uh, is that an infant or toddler's needs to develop a relationship with at least one primary caregiver for the child's successful social and emotional development. That's like a no-brainer, right? Of course that's true. That's what infants are about. Infants who have been left to themselves without any nurture, They've done studies of some of the orphanages around the world where kids get very little nurture, very little human connection, that the incredibly damaging experience of that is never leaves their experience. Wow, this primary caregiver is, is typically the most important thing. Look at this. And in particular, for learning how to effectively regulate their feelings how to regulate life and how they respond to it, how to do it well. They need a caregiver. It says fathers, and usually that's the mother, right? But here it says fathers or any other individuals are, are equally likely to become principal attachment figures if they provide most of the child care and related social interaction. In the presence of a sensitive and responsive caregiver, the infant or toddler will use the caregiver as a safe base from which to explore. And you can all picture that, right? You go down to the mall and they have this little play area, you know, right? And you take him down and you let your kid, he's just a little toddler, you know, and you let him go and you sit down. And what do they do? Well, they walk away and then they go, are they still there? And then they go, oh yeah, mom's still there. Dad's still there. Okay, I can go a little farther. And they'll go a little farther. Well, they kind of waddle like this. And then they look back and see if you're there. And when mom or dad are there, everything's safe. 
And then they come running back to you a little bit, right? And they hang out, and then they, they find out that I'm in a safe place. That's what this attachment is all about. So it says, look at this. This is fascinating. It should be recognized that even sensitive caregivers get it right only about 50% of the time. Whew, I feel so much better about myself. Their, their communications are either out of sync or mismatched. There are times when parents feel tired or distracted. Is that like the definition of being a parent? <laughs> Feeling tired and distracted? Oh, oh my gosh. So that's what it means. The telephone rings or there's a breakfast to prepare. In other words, uh, attuned interactions rupture quite frequently. But look at this. But the hallmark of a sensitive caregiver is that the ruptures are managed and repaired. That's with a child who's a pavion. Okay? Now, the next Greek word for child is technon. It means a child who is interdependent with the parent. A child who's interdependent. So it means that they're in a relationship where there has to be a negotiation back and forth. Eventually, they get a mind of their own. They have some thoughts. They learn to say no. They learn to um, have their own thoughts, some of which are crazy, you know, and you need to really deal with it. But this is an interdependent relationship, and the key here is direction and discipline. Now, the attachment needs to be there. That never goes away. But there needs to be direction and discipline with this idea of a technon. What's that the word means in itself, okay? Now, there's a third word for uh, a child. It's called huayos, and it's related. It means that these people are related or sharing the same nature or heritage. Their immediate DNA. It means they're part of the family. It's my son. It's my adult sons. It's my adult daughter. Because the key word here is they're an heir, but they're independent. They're an heir, but they're independent. So these first two, let's just kind of put a circle around these first two. The key event in these first two areas of Padeon and Technon is about identity. It's the key experience of a kid's life in learning who they are. Who they are as an individual. And their identity as a person. Their identity in your family. Their identity in your extended family. Their identity in this whole thing. That's the key event. So, we got to ask the question, which one of these is mentioned in this passage, children? And it, it is this, it's technon. It's this person who has an interdependent relationship with a parent, and the one who needs direction and discipline in addition to the attachment that they have and the nurture that's been going on. So, let's go back and read it with that in mind, okay? First of all, children, technon, interdependent people, ones who are negotiating a relationship with mom and dad. Here's the deal. Obey your parents in the Lord. Interesting, it always it adds here, in the Lord, as the Lord would have you do. See, because we're submit to one another out of our reverence for Christ. So your reverence for Christ brings you to a place of being obedient to your parents, of honoring them. It says, for this is right. This is good. This is what it ought to be about. Look at verse 2. Honor your father and mother. Now, here's a fascinating thing. To honor means to lift them up and respect them for who they are in the position that God has given them. You may not always agree, but to honor them never goes away when you're a technon. So you need to negotiate, interact with, state your preference, and honor them for the position God has put them in. For this is the first commandment with a promise, and it quotes the Old Testament, that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. That was like the most ultimate thing, is to live long in the land that God had given them. Cliff Davidson from Young Life Magazine wrote this, and I think this is the point that's being made here. It is because the way you practice responding to your parents sets the pattern inside you for the way that you most often respond to God and to other people. Learning to respond to your parents will, will teach you how to respond later to both God and to other people, because someday there are other people who will also have authority in your life. And how you respond to that, respectfully but honestly, will determine how you do in the workplace, in a marriage, and with God himself. And when you develop patterns that destroy that, you will have a life that does not go well. It's amazing. And so how you respond to your parents is critically important about how the rest of life goes. Hmm. 
That's powerful, isn't it? So parents, helping them learn how to do that will help them be successful adults. It's not just like it was in the movie. I said, that's the way it goes. It's just the law, right? Rather than saying, this is my responsibility. I will listen and care, but at the end of the day, I'm going to need to give direction and discipline. And I do it not only for the good of right now, but the good of you in the future. You may not see it or appreciate it, but it's true. Wow. Well, if that's what the children are supposed to do, dads, what are we supposed to do? Parents. So it says fathers. We'll circle it. Fathers, and I think here he speaks to us as, as dads who are supposed to lead a home. But it doesn't, I don't think it's exclusive to dad. It's kind of a parental thing to do. But it says, fathers, don't do this. Do not provoke your children to anger. Don't do it. Now, you guys, to anger is actually not in the Greek. It's part of the verb to, prov- to not provoke. So let's take an arrow and kind of bring to anger way over here to provoke. It says, do not provoke to anger your children. Do not treat your kids in a way that just pushes their buttons. Don't frustrate them unnecessarily. Don't provoke them. And it's unfortunate that somehow that does seem to be a way, that, a pattern that we do with our kids sometimes. We just frustrate them. Whether it be kidding, that's one thing, but almost on purpose to begin to kind of frustrate or provoke them. Not really understand them. How many times have you had a child say to you, you're not listening to me? And you go, my job's not to listen to you. Your job is to listen to me. But we ought to listen to them too. Doesn't mean we have to agree. Doesn't mean that they get their way. But if they never get heard, it's very frustrating. We know that as adults, right? Do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction. That's where I get discipline and direction of the Lord. Help them learn that. What does that look like? And it's under this umbrella of mutually submitting one to another. Wow, there's an idea for you. So you guys, I have some, just some thoughts here. This isn't a program, some random thoughts, and I'd like to ask you to grab onto one or two. Just grab onto one or two and go, I'd like to think about that, and I'd like to maybe do that. Okay, first of all, how to be a parent. Be consistent. Just be consistent. Uh, it frustrates kids to no end. You say, well, you, you said I was okay then, or you let me do it then. You, didn't, you weren't consistent. You told me not to do it, but I did it, and you didn't do anything. So I guess you didn't mean it. Be consistent. Secondly, respect your child. Remember, they're a human being. Made in the image of God, Imago Dei. Respect them. doesn't mean you have to agree or let them run the show. It just means respect them. Third, maybe the hardest, be empathetic. Be empathetic. You know, being a kid's not easy. Last night we were in the, we were in the car. We have uh, Anderson. It's kind of an adopted grandson staying with us for a week. And, uh, and we're tired. <laughs> Don't tell him because he'll take advantage of it. But be empathetic. Last night he was saying in the car, I miss my grandmother. He calls her Gaga. And Diane was so amazing. She said, oh, I so understand. I'm so sorry. That's got to be hard just identified with his feelings. And by the time we got home, he was fine. It's like, wow, Diane, you're amazing. Fourth, communicate your expectations. Communicate what you expect. Because if it's unspoken, they don't know. They're trying to figure it out, right? Third, be authoritative, but don't be an authoritarian. You are the authority. But you don't have to be the authoritarian with a big hammer. Be authoritative, though. Sixth, Consider the age and temperament of your child. Be a student of your child, right? Understand them. Because every child's different. Every one of my kids is different. They needed a different style. I didn't always do that very well. Seven, teach your child natural consequences. Natural consequences. Certain things happen. Don't fix it for them. Let them experience the natural consequence of their behavior. It teaches them. So, or the logical consequences, number eight. Teach them the logical consequences. Last night we said, hey, uh, hey Anderson, uh, if you eat more chips, we want you to eat your dinner, so stop on the chips. But if you don't stop on the chips, we're not going to Tedra's. So he knew the deal. Guess what he did? Started stuffing his mouth with chips. (laughs) 
We said, oh, that's a bummer. We didn't even have to get mad. Oh, it's a bummer. We're not going to Ted Drew's. That's a drag. Oh, no, no, no. Let's go to Ted Drew's. Not too late. We already told you. So it's a logical consequence. Number nine, avoid lectures and threats. I love lectures and threats. <laughs> I love them. They should work because I'm so logical. And I say it over and over and over again. And then I threaten them. Never work. Ten, create an, uh, create an award system for responsible behavior. This is one of the most powerful things I think you can do. Reward responsible behavior. Don't reward things they weren't responsible for. You're so pretty. You're so smart. Guess what? They didn't have anything to do with that. It's a God-given quality. Don't reward them for what they were given. Reward them for being responsible. Man, you were, were empathetic. You were incredibly compassionate. You took responsibility. You chose character development, not just external development. You valued that. Great job. Reward them for responsible behavior, not the things they didn't have anything to do with. Number 11, speak. Yeah, action will speak better than anger. Action will speak better than anger. So, um, uh, James Dobson once said to teachers, he was doing a teacher thing, and he said, you know how you, you, you as a teacher, you tell the kids to do something, and they don't do it, and then you say it again, and they don't do it, and you say it again, and they do it, and then finally you're like, all right, I've had it with you guys, dadgummit, boom! And then the kids do it, right? Because he finally got angry. Why? Not because you got angry, but because you took action. So why not just take action early? Just do it before you get angry. So say, oh, there's the consequence. Okay, it's great. No problem. You made a choice. That's fine. Boom. And they're like, aren't you going to get angry? No, because angry is just a waste of time and a waste of energy. So your behavior, your actions will speak better than your anger. Twelve, give yourself a break, man. Sometimes you need to give yourself a break. You give them timeouts, guess what? Sometimes you need a timeout. Give yourself a break. Number 13, integrate truth and grace in a way that's redemptive. Truth and grace, it always works in every relationship. Number 14, pray your head off. Pray your stinking head off. Number 15, love your heart out. It'll kill you, but love your heart out. Number 16, be a student of your child. Learn the uniqueness of them. Number 17, have boundaries that honor God. Have boundaries. This is what our home will be. And it's boundaries that honor God. Number 18, don't have too many boundaries. <laughs> Sometimes we have so many rules, it kills them. All right, don't have too many boundaries. Number eight, 19, get help if you need it. Get help if you need it. You go, man, it's driving me crazy. Get some help. There are people out there that can be very helpful. Start downstairs with Karen because she can be helpful. She's got a lot of wisdom and knowledge in this thing. Get some help. And then from there, we'll get you some other help, okay? Um, 20, as a parent, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be a parent. God gave you that job. Is it amazing to me that God gives the job of being a parent every time to amateurs, first-timers? <laughs> really, shouldn't he train a bunch of people up and say, okay, you'll just be the parents, you know, and we'll just keep shoving them off to them? Guess what? Being a grandparent isn't being the parent. You get to, really, you get to spoil them. Your parents, you got to be the parents. So don't be afraid. 21, be the parent, not a friend, but it is possible to be a friendly parent. We already talked about it. Number 22, just because you teach them better doesn't mean they learn better. It's a great thing. Knapp, once, Knapp or some, one of the wise elder, gentle, older gentlemen here, one day I said to him, I thought I taught him better. He goes, you may have. They may not have learned better. Blew me away. It's true. Okay, last one. Remember that we all have a broken nature parent and child. Remember, we all have a broken nature. So here's the deal. We're designed for relationships, but along the way, those relationships got all messed up, and the only hope we have is a spirit-filled life that'll give us the ability to submit to one another. So, therefore, what do we do with that? Well, here's just a few thoughts, because the struggle is real. What do you think? Here's some thoughts maybe you're having. Here's some thoughts I had this week. First of all, I feel this incredible tension between the parent God designed me to be and where I'm at. I know I didn't do it as well as I should have. I feel a great tension in that. Secondly, I feel this incredible tension between what the world tells me about being a young person and what God has designed me to do. Young people live in a world that says, tell your parents they don't matter. I don't need to listen to you. 
as a Christian young person, you have a tension to live with, with your world. And what are you going to do with that? Here's another one. I, see, I need to see my child through the eyes of Christ and love them more effectively. To see him not just as my child, but through the eyes of Christ. Wow. Here's another thought. I need to reject the cultural message that kids are second-class citizens because they're not. They're important. Next, I also need to reject the cultural message that kids don't need discipline or direction. You'll hear that sometimes in our culture, and it's not true. We leave them to their own demise if we do that. It is not a loving thing to do. It is a hateful thing to do. Wow. Here's another thought. As a technon, it's kind of like being a Klingon, but right? the technon, I need to reject the cultural message that I don't need to honor or obey my parents. That's part of your responsibility, too, to say, all right, I'm not doing it. I'm not going there. Wow. That would be incredible. Here's another thought. I still think that it'll be a miracle of God to accomplish this in our lives. And that's exactly what we're saying here. To be in a mutually submissive relationship, parent-child relationship, you have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit and surrender and be obedient to Christ day by day. It's the only way it's ever going to work. So there's some thoughts about being a parent. Um, It's not easy. Um, But it's so important. We as a church want you to know if you're a parent of a technon, we care. How how can we help you and encourage you and support you in all that you're going through? Because it is hard. And I think it's harder today than ever before. Um, I've only lived for 62 years, so I don't know before that. But I know in my time this is hard in what you're going through. We want to support you. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to finish. If you're a, a parent of a technon, and interdependent, I want you to stand up just for a second. I won't make you do anything besides stand up. Just stand up. So I would like us to pray for these people, okay? This is not easy. So I want to just pray for you. And the people around you, if you could pray silently for them, I think it'd be really important, okay? Let's pray. Father, sometimes these technons feel like aliens. Like they're from another world. And it's because in some ways they are. In some ways they're just so different. And it's hard for us to understand, but help us to understand and care and not provoke them to anger, to really dig in and understand. But also I pray that you would give these parents the strength and the courage to give discipline and direction in a way that would honor you, in a way that would build their, these young people's lives. Father, they're at risk, I think, in this world. And I pray good things into their lives. So for their kids, who may or may not be in this room, we pray that you would touch them, that you would guide them, and that you would help them to live in a way that would, so they could live long in the land and would go well in their lives. We pray for Karen and all that goes on downstairs in what they're doing in these kids' lives. Pray that you would continue to give her and their, her staff, all that they need. And we pray for Jake, and for that whole group that work with the student ministry, that you would give them great wisdom and courage to come alongside these parents to develop these young people who matter so much. And so it's to that end that we need you desperately. We need your Holy Spirit to live inside of us to make a difference. And so to these, those things we pray, and we ask you to move and you to do what you can do. And so we want to stop and we want to worship you together as your people for these purposes. Amen. All right, let's worship together.